In this episode of the How to Do Your 20s podcast, I have on Grant, and he is a fellow food entrepreneur. Funny enough, I was looking at different food, uh, different nut butter companies. He came up, I sent him a message, and he's already been very nice. We've been talking before the show, been very nice sharing secrets, sharing all the, the fun stuff. So in this episode, we're going to talk about the nuts and bolts of entrepreneurship. So first off, Grant, thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So let's get started in your story. How did you... How did you start a food company? What was your entrepreneurship journey? <laughs> yeah, it's a funny it's a funny question to answer because the story sounds kind of fake. Um, I've started several companies in the past, and I got the starting company bug a long time ago. And you know how it is. As soon as you start the first one, that's it, uh, especially if it's kind of built, built in you. And most of my companies were services, financial services, investment services, things like that. And really, the food company came, first of all, because I'm very curious. So if I don't know how to do something, I want to figure out how to do it. And so I started an e-commerce company, which we we talked about some and you you know a lot about. And I started a product development company where I had to we built products and sourced them out of China and all of that good stuff just because I didn't know how to do it. And I keep a running list of company ideas on in Evernote. And you know it's one of those things where you're adding to it every day, like oh that'd be a good company, that'd be a good company. Uh, but the nut butter company wasn't on it. So funnily enough, I get most of my ideas uh, when I'm sleeping. So I, it, like I dream about them. I keep a notebook next to my bed, and when ideas pop in my head, I have to wake up and write them down. So it's like I guess uh, technically I dreamt about it, and I remember I remember still to this day it's a big room full of flavored nut butters that were healthy for you and tasted awesome. That was it. And I wrote it down, and I woke up and told my wife I was thinking about starting a nut butter company, and you know she did what she always does, like okay, whatever. <laughs> And uh, that was two years ago this month. Wow. So how long after you had the dream did you actually – and what, what were the first steps you took to actually starting the company? Sure. I, the, the good thing about having several companies and a couple of that have not done well is kind of knowing what not to do on the front end. Uh, and so I am very, very big about testing, testing, testing real early on to make sure that you have something that people want. And that's, you know, a lot of things, a lot of times the thing that entrepreneurs skip, it's like you fall in love with your product and then you realize later on down the line, if you spend a bunch of money and time that nobody wants it. And so within, let's see, within, I mean, within days, maybe even that night, I went and bought a bunch of ingredients at Costco and I thought of, I wrote down as many flavored combinations for peanut butter and almond butter as I could think of that I might like. And I started mixing by hand in my kitchen and I bought these little three ounce mason jars. You can get it, you know, whatever, Walmart. And I'd mix them up, I'd mix the batch up, and then I would post them on Facebook. And I'd say, hey, I'm thinking about starting a nut butter company and uh, we're working on samples. If you want some, let me know, we'll send you some for free. Hmm. And within, so within a couple of days, I was sending out these little bitty disgusting jars of whatever kind of combinations. We had 35 flavors we tried out. And then what I was doing was, just getting as much feedback as possible and so when all those people would get free product i'd follow up and i would ask them what they liked about it but more importantly what they didn't like about it Mm. that's the part people forget about too right it's like you know your mother loves you all the time but what are they going to tell you that's honest and so i would make them tell me like what no tell me at least something that you hate about this peanut butter almond butter whatever it was and so we kept narrowing it down at the same time i started meeting with stores just immediately to get their feedback because i there are a lot of people, especially in the food business, who go, who have a passion for food, and then they forget about the business side. And I'm the opposite. Like I love the business, so I wanted to make sure that our product was set up to where, if we did succeed, that we were ready to go for those people. And um, after a couple of weeks of sending out samples, uh, the the next big move was, okay, you said you like this. Now, will you pay for it? Mm-hmm. Which is the kicker, right? And so, I I only sent out samples. It was only for a couple of weeks. And then even if the batches were not the best in the world, I'd make people pay for them. And so I'd put on Facebook, hey, we've got a new batch of, you know, maple, vanilla, whatever. Eh, Who wants some? It's going to be eight bucks for a jar. And I bought normal size mason jars and I would write the flavor on the side of it and make them pay for it and ship it out. And we uh, we sold out every time. And so that's kind of what gave us the early validation. And and that's kind of got us through the very first steps. Okay, so the next step from there, so I mean, at first you were selling it in like the, the smaller mason jars, and what about, were you making it uh, in your house, or were you making yep. this, okay. Yeah, like right now, I, you know, I've got one of those apps that shows me pictures from, you know, the past, mm-hmm. 
it's called time hop and the pictures that are popping up because it's our kind of two-year anniversary are pictures of me with a mixing bowl i mean i would literally come in and just every night because i was doing my this was a side gig it's another thing is i i mean it was complete uh, side gig just at night kind of thing and i would come home and i would start mixing stuff and mixing making notes and tasting them and bowls and spoons and junk everywhere and then i would scoop it into little jars and we would spend that night put them in boxes and shipping them out it was as as low level as you can get when did you know you're ready to take i mean i assume the next step is either getting uh, better manufacturing equipment or or actually what was the next step for you when did you, and when did you know it was time to take that next step well so there really were about a thousand little steps so i'm a big a big fan of of scaling incrementally very very small so not you know back in the some of my prior companies and i see this with a lot of people but you jump steps so it's like okay hey, all my friends love it let's open this big huge company and sell it to everybody and i and i just knew that's not the way it really works so what i would do is kind of identify what i felt were the next five to ten steps that i think i would have to approach and i would hit the first one and that's it and i what i'm always willing to do now with any of my companies or products is I'll ditch it if it doesn't work. So if I get to a level of scale, I don't fall in love with anything anymore. Um, I love the process. I love building business. But if I would have gotten past that step, let's say that everybody bought it, my friends bought it. Well, the next step is really putting it in front of people who don't know me. And so then we opened up an e-commerce store. Um, you know, I built all that and I don't know what I'm doing. So it was just throwing stuff together very inexpensively. And we put it out uh, to people who we didn't know. And that was a huge step because it's like, okay, now it's real. Let me see if people who don't know us like it because they're going to be honest with you. And then we started selling to them and they liked it. And we we are distributed via retail platforms, so grocery stores a lot and things like that. So then it was, okay, let's go meet with some stores and see if they'll carry it. And you know, along the way, you're having to develop a label and figure out FDA specs. And because once the other thing is once we got to the beginning of even selling you know, I can't do that stuff in my house. Like we wanted everything uh, regulated the right way. So it's just, it's a big, it was a big puzzle of a bunch of different pieces and just being very careful not to get ahead of ourselves. Once we hit that level of like, okay, now, um, you know, I, I can't even remember. Okay. We have, you know, one store accepts it and then it starts selling and then it's 10 and you're like, okay, cool. Now get to 50, now get to a hundred. And, just very, very specifically approaching those levels and making sure that we had the validation we need to kind of move to the next step. And how did you get your first wholesale account? Was it just as simple as walking in and <laughs> saying, hey, here's the product? Or how does uh, that work? Actually, yes. So I remember it specifically. There's a, I live in Nashville, and there's a group of uh, kind of coffee shop, bakery, restaurant chains that everybody knows in town. And uh, that was my first pitch meeting. And I just, I mean, I think I'd emailed them and just said, hey, I'm a start a peanut butter company in town. And I'd love for you guys to carry it if you want to. And I come from a finance background. So for me, back in the day, I mean, pitching for me is, you know, suit and tie boardroom at some corporation with a bunch of, uh, you know, 65 year old white guys. And so I was like, I don't even know what to wear. Like, I have no idea. And I get, I was getting my pitch already, and you know, I, I think I ended up pulling the whole blazer jeans entrepreneur look kind of thing that you do, you see on TV. And I rolled in that meeting. It was a chef, and it was the baker, and you know, they're wearing t-shirts with stains all over them. They they didn't care. And I started pitching, and they stopped me, and they said, "Hey, man, like we tasted it. It tastes really good. Like we want to carry it." And I was just, I was kind of flabbergasted. I was like, "Wait, what's that easy?" And they're like. Yeah, I mean, yeah, man, you make it in town and it tastes good. So yeah, we'll carry it. And that was my first order. And they're still a food service and a retail client today. So one of the things I liked about and still do about this business is it's not this simple, but it is sometimes as simple as here's my product. Do you like it? If so, great. So it's not always, there's there's not a subjective nature a lot of times. Uh, of course, that changes once you get into the scale. But yeah, that's that's how I got my first retail customer. And are you, I don't know if you're currently in like the Whole Foods, the the different supermarkets. And if if so, what does that process look like and how is it different from the, the smaller <laughs> stores? Oh, man, it's grocery is a whole different animal. And we learn, you know, one of the things I say is that I, I guess my job is to learn the hard lessons so I don't have to do them again. Grocery is one of those things. Um, grocery is a, its own unique animal. The, th the thing is getting into grocery stores locally is very easy, uh, especially if you live, Nashville is a, a very... Uh, a very branded town. I mean, people love Nashville if you live here. And so stores want to carry local products. 
And so it's really easy um, to, to get into stores locally. The problem is when you scale, it's a whole different model. You've got a lot of intermediaries that are involved. So you've got distributors, you've got food brokers, um, you've got the actual grocery store. So a lot of times you're not even negotiating for your own product. It's going through other parties for you. So there, we, we got into a lot of grocery stores very, very quickly, and it almost put us out of business. Um, there are things, if you're not from the business that, and I'm not, that I didn't know existed, such as slotting fees and free fills and, and a free fill for those people who don't know is basically, yeah, we'll let you in the store. We just want your product for free for the first time. And then you'll start getting paid after it's sold and we reorder. So I remember my first big game changing month, uh, we got $60,000 in orders, which for us was massive at the time. And I think I ended up getting paid 18 grand on those orders because of free fills and slotting fees. And so very quickly, it's the, it's, well, it's like a lot of businesses it's that sometimes the optics don't match up to the financials. So from an optics perspective, it looked really cool. And everybody was like, oh my gosh, y'all are in a thousand grocery stores. And I'm like, that doesn't matter. It, like, it looks cool, but if you're not profitable on those deals, so... And what we're doing now is restructuring how we approach that. And it, you know, it's funny. We're it's a constant struggle because there are so many things you can't control on grocery. So, as an example, we are in a bunch of Kroger's in the area, and Kroger, we they've they've been great. We have a good relationship, but uh, they are routinely out of stock. And so you'll sell real fast, and then they'll forget to reorder, or the distribution company won't make the delivery, and we'll have people calling us. We'll. It doesn't seem like a bad thing, but it is because we get judged based on our velocity, which means how fast our product moves off the shelves. So if we sell out, they don't put any back, then it's not getting repurchased. And so our sales numbers for, for divisional, which is everything, all grocery is, is are you selling and how fast are you selling? Uh, and so they don't look as good. So it's constantly like, hey, can you restock us? Can you? And that's every store we have everywhere. So it's a very frustrating model. And it can be done, but you have to be very, very careful about it. And so we're trying. We, we've been spending a lot of time meeting with people who have done it well, and trying to figure out what what they've done, how they've avoided these kind of issues. And what, what we're finding is it really comes down to the relationships you're able to develop. Right? There's there's always a person who can make your life easier. And if that person says, "Hey, we want your product in 1,500 stores, and let's do a profitable deal, and let's make it good for both parties," I mean, that's really how you have to do it. So yeah, it's a, groceries a, a struggle even to this day. So it sounds like grocery is kind of a pain in the butt. As far as the e-commerce side, how have you been able to get people to your website and differentiate yourself? Because there is, as we both know, a lot of nut butter companies out there. Yep. Um, differentiation, uh, I I set up what I felt was a differentiation very, very early on because I, I, I'm a big believer. You're right. There's a ton. It's a crowded space. So I had to look at it and go, do I feel that there's a market hole? And I did. And even to this day, I still do is that really where we feel you've got some really good companies and, and mind you, we're mainly retail. So e-commerce is a little bit different and I'll kind of hit on that, but we had to know specifically what our positioning was going to be and believe in it. Cause you can't just go out there and be like, Hey, it tastes good. You're like, that, that's great. But a lot of people have good products that never sell anything. And so on the e-commerce side, I mean, it really came down more to your ability to market. Uh, and as an e-commerce guy, you know, this, like it wasn't really we don't really look at it as differentiation on the e-commerce. It's more about can we effectively market and run our Facebook ads and build our social presences and our content marketing and our influencer marketing. And it's that whole different ballgame, which I love. And I've got, I've set up, I've got an e-commerce company, but I'm not a tactician like you are. I don't know all of that stuff. And it drives me insane because I want to, right? So uh, we, we actually use a company now that runs our Facebook ads for us. Uh, and they do a really good job. It's profitable. Um, and then we still run a lot of our own social. Uh, I actually write our email marketing campaigns and deal with a lot of our influencers. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, that's just a whole, you know, it's, you know how it is a different world. You've got to approach it. it it's really a full-time job of dealing with all those because they all matter so much. Making sure you're relevant in social and making sure you're running profitable ads and Amazon's been started to become a good platform for us. Um, once again, it's for me a whole, I mean, I buy a bunch of stuff on Amazon, but I've never sold. It took us months even to get approved to get to be able to sell on their platform. And we're actually about to work with somebody who's going to run that for us too. So uh, not as much about differentiation, more about just marketing. 
What are your plans for 2017? Obviously, it's the news. The year's still pretty new. Where do you see you taking the business? Are you? And we talked a little bit before, but are you going to double down on the retail, or are you going to double down on the e-commerce, or a little bit of both? It's a combination of a few things. We so I raised a little bit of money um, late last year. It's a very expensive business to run the way we're doing. We manufacture in house, and then dealing with grocery. So beginning of the year, we kind of restructured. So we. The way we look at it, we have we have different sales channels. So a lot of you hear a lot about like focusing on your customer. Well, we have different channels with different customers. So on grocery, we're going to be very very specific and do good deals that are profitable that we can control and none others. Um, I, it was very hard, and I, I did get swept up into the the optics of everything early on. Of all these stores want you, but they want you to pay for it. And so now it's we're very specific of you could have the biggest store in the world. I mean, we, we had, I mean, we had a store that wanted to put us in 3000 stores and I turned it down because it wasn't a profitable deal. So we're going to be specific on grocery to be profitable. We do food service, which is bulk peanut butter for restaurants. And we're going to do more of those contracts. Um, our biggest, really, I'll tell you where most of our revenue, our new revenue is coming from is what we, what we call alternative channels. So when I look at the, the market landscape of nut butters, it's an extremely crowded field, right? And on a, on a shelf in a grocery store, you've got whatever it is, 10 feet of comp- competition, and everybody's fighting for that six inches of shelf space. So to me as a business person, it's like that doesn't – that's not good from a business perspective. It's not viable. It's not sustainable because let's say you get in. Well, they can kick you out any time, and it happens all the time. So what I started thinking about is where can we go that's alternative that people aren't thinking about – that has higher margins and, and is easier to control. And so we do a lot of stuff with um, hotels. Uh, hotels have been a good market for us. Basically, what we do when we look at a channel is we talk, try to identify a channel that has um, what we call uh, multi-level benefits. And so as an example of that, a hotel, um, right now, uh, snacks and hotels are huge. They're really upping their game to go to natural snacks. So let's say you're downstairs and they have a pantry where they sell snacks. We can be in there. They have a breakfast bar where they serve fresh, hot food and fruit. Our packets can be next to the fruit for the bananas. They do corporate gift baskets for their in-house stuff. We can be in those gift baskets, and they do in-snack rooms. We can be in there. So there's a potential for me to sell multi- multiple ways to a hotel. So we do like a, a broad range of hotels. We're doing a lot with athletics. So we have some deals that we've done with pro athletic teams because um, it's the same kind of thing. It's like, well – so somebody brought it to us that the NBA players eat a ton of peanut butter. So it was like, sweet, let's go. So we reach out, hey, you know, and they take samples, and then we do a deal. Um, so those have been really good. Um, colleges and universities have been a huge thing for us. Once again, it's the same thing. that um, what, what we try to do, every, every channel we look at, and we probably have 100 we're testing right now, is we have to be able to test it inexpensively and efficiently. So once, kind of like the early days of validating my product, fast, cheap, is it going to work? If not, kill it. Uh, so college and universities, we have, we're doing deals with the athletic teams. The, the athletic teams these days are paying huge attention to the nutrition aspect of everything. So they're actually sourcing the food for their teams. So we go and we will meet with all the individual teams and the department as a whole. We can actually sell product to the individual teams. They have their own budgets and then to the athletic department as a whole. And then on the flip side, there's student dining services, which for a, for a nice private university they can have 15 or 20 places to eat and they have coffee shops and they have uh, snack bars and things like that so we sell it to them on that side as well so multiple benefits colleges and universities high margins so really everything we do is that like we're spending a ton of time basically avoiding optics completely and i now i've gotten to the point where i'm like i don't care if anybody sees a jar of ours on any shelf as long as we're profitable and making money and doing these large scalable deals I mean, that's what it's all about. So for me, it, it, I had to get past some of the vanity aspects of owning a business, right? Because it's nice when everybody's like, oh, you're doing so great. But uh, we've circled completely back around or, and are doing these alternative deals. That's, so that's our, that's our huge focus for 2017. Sounds like you're doing a lot. Is it just you in the business or do you have uh, a few other people working as well? I have uh, three total full-time, including me. So there's myself. Then I have a number two. Uh, she's my chief growth officer who I hired two months ago. And then I have director of operations who handles everything manufacturing fulfillment. And then we have production crew. It can flex anywhere between four and ten people. So, uh, yeah, very small, very lean shop. Yeah, but still at the same time, it's uh, I mean, it's small and lean, but at the same time, it's impressive, I guess, is 
the, the best. It's way to good say it. now. I mean, it it, sh- it changes very fast. Um, it was only me uh, uh, for the majority of it. I mean, Andrea, who's my number two, came on like I said two months ago, and that's been yeah. game changer for for me because you get to the point as you're scaling out that your bandwidth gets just stretched too thin where you just can't do everything effectively. And so all, what you do is you, I looked back and it was, I, I, I got to the point where I was holding up our business because I am handling everything and you cannot handle everything effectively. But the hard part is you got to pay for those people, right? So it's not, I, I feel people struggles because a lot of times it's people just tell them, hey, you need to delegate. You need to find somebody to do the things that you don't need to be doing. And it's like, yeah, that sounds great, hmm. but you have to be able to afford that also. And um, so, yeah, things are a lot different now. It's we're definitely uh, we've definitely spread the workload out and and having those people on our team has been extremely beneficial. And then as far as uh, so you said you had another e-commerce business as well. What, how much time do you spend on that? What, what is that business, if you don't mind sharing as well? So um, I have a holdings company and all, all that is is an LLC that I set up so that I, I could put any pet projects into it. Um, I say e-commerce company because that's most of what it is. I've done everything from we released a golf fitness product a couple of years ago. That's my tinkering company. That's what I do, and it's all side stuff. And right now, it's very little time, and so it's not really making any money. Um, I've set up a couple of t-shirt shops and um, different. What what I like to do on that front is try to find um, niches of people that are very passionate about what they do. So. It's, you know, if you're a CrossFitter, you're a CrossFitter. Like, that's what you, that's how you identify yourself. You know, if you're a, right now, if you're demographically, if you're a Nashvillian, you tell everybody about it because everybody loves Nashville right now. So I, I like to find people that are passionate about whoever they are and see if I can't market something towards them. But those businesses are equally, if not more, about me just learning the craft because I, I don't like not to know something. So you and I talked before we started recording about, your e-commerce background. Well, I, I love to know how to do that. So I, that's my side, I guess, call it my side hustle now. But as, since I have a financial company and I have a peanut butter company, that one is on the back burner usually. So it's more of like, Hey, I can't sleep. Let me go in here. And, um, thankfully I've set up enough stores where I can throw them up pretty quickly and test them out, see if people are resonating with the products. If they are, then I'll scale it out a little bit. Um, but yeah, it's, it definitely goes up and down in terms of, <laughs> of whether they're moving at all. So let's get back to the Nut Butter Company then. So all right. One of the big things that I mean, I know I'm struggling with, and I'm sure a lot of people listening are probably interested in or struggling with, is the idea of, all right, this is great, you have a product that works, but what about like the FDA? What about all these regulations, especially in food? What kind of, ho- what kind of hoops do you have to jump through uh, to get it like FDA approved or is that as intense as people think, or what does that look like? Well, I so I have a, I'll answer that specifically and in a little bit more general manner. Um, so yes and no, meaning that from the FDA perspective, it's terrifying, right? Because you you've got to go through this government agency. It's a whole different ball game. And yeah, it wasn't easy. It wasn't near as bad as I made it up to be in my mind. Um, it, the way they put it when I was meeting with them is, I mean, I had everything ready to go and I'd done my research. I knew exactly what they wanted. And it was still terrifying when you get a full audit done by the FDA or by the Department of Agriculture. It's terrifying because this government agency is coming in basically to tell you whether or not you can be in business, right? And they can shut you down at any time. And I and I and we have a peanut butter company, which is an inherently risky product. There are peanut allergies. There's the, the issue of having a listeria outbreak or anything like that can happen. And a lot of those things are not easy to control. But Really, uh, the, the answer is it was tough, but it was one of the thousand things that was really hard to do with setting up a business. And I, and for me, I enjoy that process, but so many times you're going to get to these hurdles when you're setting up a business and it's like, oh crap, that's scary and hard. Like, welcome to setting up a business, like everything, right? And so uh, I don't look at it like that. I, and I, I used to because I, I would, you know, make something bigger in my head than it was. But that was, to me, just one of the thousand things. So I approached it as, let me do my research. I, I've really had to work on not putting mental energy into things I can't control. And I, I tend to be kind of a worrier a little bit about the business aspects because it's everything I do. So what I try to do now is control what I can. So, okay, I do my research. What does the FDA want? Let me do that. And then that's it. And if they come in and I get, you know, a jerky guy who hates me and whatever, like I'll have to deal with that then, but it doesn't do me any good to worry about it. And actually once they came in, it was funny and it makes sense to me now, but they said like, listen, 
you don't understand the nasty stuff we see. They're like, we see the worst of the worst. Compared to these people, you're the best ever. Like you, I, I think I got a 98 my first audit. And so it was like, it was overblown and I put too much mental energy worrying about it. But no, I mean, it's like anything else. Do your research, figure out, talk to people. You know, I mean, uh, I think the biggest thing I've done well in building this business is just talking to people who've done it before me. Like, I mean, my, I've got some mentors, you know, you call them mentors. There's people who help me, but it's like, Hey, you've built a food business. Tell me <laughs> what I need to watch out for. And those people, we still talk all the time and we're all still going through the same issues, but having somebody could say, Hey, this is kind of what the FDA, I mean, I, one guy in particular told me, these are the things that I kind of got hit on that I didn't even realize I was supposed to have done, you know, certain types of lighting fixtures and the temperature of the water and the in the hand washing sink and all these little things. So yeah, doing your research and then talking to people is, is really all I do all the time. I think that's a great tip about the finding mentors or finding people that have already done it. In your case, how did you find those mentors? Did you just reach out to other people in the food space or how was that process? Well, uh, so it's funny that you hear the term mentor thrown around a lot. I don't really use it. Like um, I, it's not a bad word, but people who aren't in our space in terms of building business or entrepreneurship, look at this mentor word as this formal thing, right? Like, hey, sir, will you be my mentor? And it's really not. I mean, uh, there's a guy in town in Nashville called, his name's Dan Stevenson, and he owns a macaroni and cheese company. And I knew of Dan's company forever. So when I started, I mean, he's the first person I, I thought of. And this is the part where you can go wrong, though, is I could have easily said like, hey, Dan, you know, tell me everything you know about the food business. And instead it was, Dan, I'm a huge fan of your company. I love what y'all do. I'd love to buy you a cup of coffee and just get to know you a little bit. Um, this is what I'm doing. And from that day forward, I mean, I talked to Dan like two days ago. And that was two years. But, you know, it's it's the ability to develop a real relationship with somebody. And so what happens is, uh, number one, not going and asking for too much and understanding that they've put a lot of effort into this and not everybody just wants to show you their playbook. But once we got together, you know, Dan, would I'd ask for, you know, he'd give me little tricks and tips here and there. And then we just grew a friendship to where it became now to this day. I could text him right now and be like, hey, dude, I'm dealing with this. Like, what have you seen? But he does it to me now, too, that I've got some experience. Grant, are you seeing anything on this front? So I did that with everybody, anybody who is even close to connected to the food space. And a lot of it is having built somewhat of a decent network over the last 10 years uh, in this area. So having people that I could call on. We're ve the, the guys in our space, we kind of have a group of people that are not not really an inner circle, but there are those people that you have relationships with that no questions ask. You call them and you have the trust factor. So if Will calls me and says, hey, can you intro to me? No questions asked. Done. Because he's a trusted relationship. And so we're very, very specific about protecting those relationships. And people get that wrong too. So you'll get, you know, you, you know this is you'll get a cold introduction from somebody that you didn't get approval to get introduced to, or somebody will ask you to share your contact list or like all those cheesy networking mentory, none of that stuff works. And so it's all about developing trusted relationships, never breaking that. If somebody breaks that trust with us, it's it. I mean, you're not, you're not in that circle anymore. And it sounds kind of crazy, but it's so, so important. So knowing that I could call uh, Will, who would introduce me to Dan and vet for me, and that Dan knows because Will said it was okay that I'm not a guy that's going to come in there and try to like sell him life insurance or something. So uh, I would say that the relationships in my space, but not only that in business in general, I mean, that's how I was able to raise money. That's how really anything I do, it's it's the people. It's all the people. So, you know, having the ability to be very intentional about creating those relationships is game changer. Let's talk about the, the raising money because that's a pretty big step in a business. And it seems like, <laughs> yeah. it seems like in food businesses at a certain point you almost need to because like you talked about cash flow constraints. What was that process like? Did you have the full pitch? Did you actually have to wear the suit and tie this time? Or uh, Well... No, yes and no. So I, it was terrifying. The scariest thing I've done to this day in this, in any business I've ever had is raise money. Uh, I had bootstrapped every other business, anything I've ever had. And I bootstrapped this one for a while. And then Grant's bootstrapping fund was about <laughs> tapped out. So I, the thing is I come from finance, but I don't come, I come from uh, public equity. So I don't have any experience in private equity. And so, but it, it became the same process on the front end, or it was. It was meet with people who are in that space and know what they're doing, 
find out everything I can from them. And I there's a guy in town named Jason Denenberg who worked in the startup venture capital space. He was my mentor for that thing. And Jason's younger than me. So <laughs> mentorship has nothing to do with age. So he became, and I, and with him, I'd known him for a while and it became, I was almost apologetic and he was fine with it, but I asked him, he took a lot of his time to explain to me the ins and outs of how to raise a, how to raise money. What does the deal look like? I mean, those are complex financial deals and you've got to really know what you're talking about. So on the front end, the research, the people that all say the same. When I actually went into the fundraise, that was kind of the complete unknown to me because it's. It's like putting your product out there. It's like, I don't know. Like, I love this and people buy it, but I don't know. Like, are people going to give me their money? And for me, I wasn't going to VC firms. We're doing a a seed round. So, you know, angels, friends and family, high net worth individuals kind of stuff. And so I was really concerned with how to even approach the first person. I mean, I, it, it caused me a lot of anxiety for a little while because it was like, we need this money, but I I don't want to screw it up. And I'll tell you the biggest thing for me getting ready for that was the fundraising process was important because it helped me really figure out whether I believed in what I was doing or not, because you can't pitch something that you don't firmly believe can work. And also when you're asked, it's one thing when it's my money, when you're asking people for their money, it's their livelihood on the, on the books now. And it's not just you. So that's stress. I didn't anticipate that the first time somebody wrote me a check, it was a different ball game. Because then it was, I mean, I know a lot of these people. They're not VCs in New York City. These are people that I have relationships with, a lot of them, probably half and half. And so I don't want to lose their money, right? It's, it, so going into that process, I had to gut check really, 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 really heavily of, is this model, uh, you had to pull back the whole, I think this can work and get to a point of, I know this can work. And I believe that I have the skill set to take it there. So when I got to the actual pitch stage, um, I, it really was a lot like dating. Um, what I would do, it started with relationships. So first of all, I emailed everybody I know in my network really. And the whole, the pitch and this worked the entire time was, Hey, I'll use an example. Hey, Will, um, you probably know, maybe you don't, I own a peanut butter company. We started a couple of years ago. We've been growing fast. We're looking to raise some money and I'd love it. If, if you know, if you or anybody, you know, would be interested in possibly investing, let me know. And I'm happy to send them more information. That's the pitch. That's the whole thing. So I, I, I wanted these people, a lot of them who were friends, to have an easy way to say no. I don't want to put pressure on them because then it can all of a sudden we've got this awkwardness and they feel like I'm like, you know, salesman. I don't want to be a salesman. So, hey, if you or anybody you know is interested, that's I, I use that line these days more than anything I use for anything because what it does is if, if I say to somebody, first of all, they can go, I'm interested, send me the information, or they can go, I'm not interested, but I might know a guy. So it accomplishes two of those things. So I had people that were directly interested and it became, uh, yeah, I'm interested. Let me know what's going on. And so I did, I created a pitch deck, which I didn't know what a pitch deck was before. It's just a PowerPoint presentation. Um, very, very simple. And I, to, to figure that out, I Googled like what should be in a pitch deck. You know, Google can be a, a very important tool. And I looked at, mainly I looked at Airbnb's original pitch deck. I mean, you know, the company that's worth billions of dollars. I was like, well, if they can do it. And theirs is a simple it's like five slides and there's hardly any words on it. And I was like, okay, cool. And so I, I put together a pitch deck. I would email that to people. And then they would say, uh, if they were interested, they'd say, hey, um, let's get together and talk about it. And then I would just go in and tell the story. And that was, once again, it was a gut check. Because like, you can't BS people when you're in front of them, right? They can, they can see it. So I had to firmly believe what I was pitching. And the hardest part about raising that money was you don't have the financials to back it up at that point. I mean, we were you know, 18 months in. So we we're not profitable. We, we haven't gotten to that position yet and we're burning through a bunch of cash. So we have good optics on some sides and bad optics on another side. So I had to be able to convince them of why I felt that even though we weren't making money, that it'd be a good place for them to put their money. And, um, I will tell you it was a lot easier than I thought it was going to be. Uh, we raised that, that round pretty quickly. Um, we're still, we're still raising money and we're going to go to a VC round next year, hopefully. But, what, what happened is that people were resonating with my story. So really what they were doing, and, and this is nothing, I don't know why, but they were betting on, they're betting on me. And so I guess they could sense kind of the passion I had for it. And not only that, but a little bit of the knowledge of, I have a very specific plan on how I believe we're going to grow and that will change some, but being able to go and say, this is where we're been. This is where we're going. These are our struggles. These are the things we're doing really, really well. And these are the things we're going to fix. 
these are the big mistakes we've made, like being completely vulnerable. Cause I felt that I would rather do that. And somebody say, nah, I'm good. I don't want to do it. I'd be like, okay, I'm completely understand that. Um, but on the flip side, there are people that go, you know what? I believe in what you're doing. I think you're capable. I'd like to be a part of that. And so that's, that, that's kind of how the process work. It's, it's terrifying for sure. But, um, it's good for you as a founder kind of internally and mentally to figure out whether you really need to be doing it. Let's talk about some of the, I mean, we've already talked about a ton of them, but what are some of the <laughs> biggest mistakes you see people making when trying to start a business or a food business? You talked about not testing, not validating. What are some of the other ones that you see? There are a lot. Uh, the hard part is even in my business, which I've started several in the past, I mean, I, I've made tons of mistakes uh, and big ones, big, big mistakes. The grocery, I made big mistakes on that front. I think the 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 number one mistake I see people who are starting their first business or want to is number one, falling in love with their product. Um, people get, if you, you've probably met people like this, but they're so excited about their product and that's fine. Like I get it. But what people don't understand is that that excitement goes away the first time, you know, the first time I was covered in peanut butter in a whole kitchen that was 105 degrees and my jars were late and you know, the batch was ruined that goes away. So that initial, like, it's kind of like dating, right? It's like the first couple of dates are like, ah, oh, this is awesome. Well, wait till you've been married for five years. Like that's when you know whether you really need to be in that relationship or not. It's the same thing. So what I, what I would have done differently is found a way to be completely objective. And so what, what happens is you go to, you go into this with this product and you go into it blind with blinders on, meaning that all you really want is for people to tell you how great you're going to be and how successful you can be. And you can do anything you want, Johnny. And what, what I did on this company, what I should have done with all the others is go in saying, tell me what's wrong about my product or my business, please. Like I ask you, and I still do this. What is bad? You need to be willing for people to say like, this sucks. And we use this method even now with strategy. We meet with people who have sold companies for hundreds of millions of dollars exclusively to see if they hate what we're doing. Like if we have a strategy, we want them to go, if, if that sucks, cool, tell us. And, that, and we're fine with that. The problem is early on, most people are very sensitive and don't want to get any negative information. You should be seeking out the negative information because that's the reality check of what, whether or not your business has any validity to it at all, whether or not you can move forward. Um, because you get, you get through that and you put a bunch of money and time or either into a business and then you have a, you don't have a clear strategy or customer base that wants your stuff, you're going to fail and you're not going to fail in the right way. So that's number one out of, uh, you know, thousands of other mistakes that we all make all the time. Um, the other thing I, if I had to pick one more, it would be, um, spending too long preparing. So you, I see this a lot on college campuses, um, there's some really good entrepreneurship programs around here, and you see all the time that they're they're preparing. Whatever their product, their service, they're researching, they're preparing. We've been working on this for six months. We've been working on this for a year. Preparation is fine to a point, and then it becomes just get something done. It, you know, it's it, it's cliche now, but the minimum viable product, your MVP. That's why I was shipping out these not great jars of peanut butter because we had to get something in the market. Because what happens is you get this product, if you spend two years on it, and then you get it to the market, it's they're not going to like it the way it is. You're never going to release your first version to the market, and they're going to fully accept it. So you get something out there so that the market can help you adjust it rather than you adjusting it based on your own internal guidelines of what you think the market wants. And so – Instead of going, I had one group that they were like, hey, we're about to order 100,000 units of this thing they had invented. And I was like, okay, that sounds awful. Who's Who do you have lined up to buy? And they're like, well, we think that these people, and we're doing research on these people, and who do you have committed to buying your product? And they didn't have anybody. And that's you see that a lot. It's like too much preparation, not enough action, execute, get something out there, change it as you go. Our products look drastically different today than they did three months ago and that's just the way it works and they two years from now hopefully they'll look in a whole different level than they than they do today so th those two things i think are the biggest that i see i want to wrap up here a little bit but i have one last question i always ask people before they they head off uh, and that is if you have any, do you have any advice for people all the listeners out there that are in their 20s anything you wish you would have known earlier on and it could be about entrepreneurship it could be about peanut butter or it could be about something completely different uh, yeah I, I do there's a lot of those things as I think back I'm 36 now and so I think back when I was 20 
Um, I, I would say if you think that you want to start something, start a side hustle immediately. And I'll give you an example of that. I had somebody that um, had an idea for a food company, and I'm in that space, and she had been working on it and thinking about it and this and that, and she had a recipe. And I asked her, I said, well, have you sold any of these? She's like, no, no, not yet. And I told her, I said, tomorrow on campus, put some of that in bags and sell it on the, the corner of the campus right there. And it, and it caught her off guard. Because it was, there's a big dividing line between I want to and I'm preparing to start a business to I'm doing and putting yourself out there. And the ability to be completely vulnerable, which starting a business, it's, it's kind of like saying, here's my baby. Do you like it? It is the most vulnerable position you will ever be in. And that's a huge fear point for most people. So I, I would say you've got to figure that out first. So take something and try to sell it immediately. I don't care what it is, side hustle, whatever, do something. And one of two things will happen. Either it'll completely empower you. And that's what it did to me. It was like this feeling of you've, oh my goodness, like this is awesome. Or it'll, it'll show you that you don't need to be doing it. And neither one of those is right or wrong. You just got to figure it out and, and quit like reading, right? It's, you can read all day long, you can research all day long, but you got to actually get something to market. So get something to market fast, figure out if you really want to do it. Yeah, I, I totally agree with, with everything you're saying. I mean, I, I realized as you're talking, some of the mistakes I did make, um, probably should have done more testing than I did earlier on. But the, one of the positive things is I, I told myself, all right, I got 30 working days, I'm going to get this done, I'm going to it's going to be done by this day. Mm -hmm. And that's helped me out a ton because I mean, even right now I told you I'm nine days until no, uh, eight days until launch. And it's like, if I would have, I'd want to put, I keep wanting to push that back, but I'm like, no, 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 no. Let's just keep it how it is. Truth is I'll make it happen. You know, it's not, it's and not if you important. don't, yeah. and if you don't, it's okay. Right? Like yeah. that's the hardest part is it, we're, we're kind of programmed for people. To, we want people to like us. I mean, I completely, like I don't want my business to fail, but, it, like if you don't, what I what I found personally as I've gotten more into like these kind of things, talking to you about this, is when you do go through those things that are so so hard, nobody's talking about those things, right? You get on Instagram. If you want to see what entrepreneurship isn't, get on Instagram and hashtag entrepreneur, and you see the cars and the money and everything. What entrepreneurship really is the biggest highs and the biggest lows you'll ever go through. And so when people go through those lows, and you don't show that to other people then it, it doesn't, it's not an honest look at what it really is. And what I found is when I'm completely vulnerable, even with my investors, when we make a huge mistake and burn a bunch of money and I tell them, people appreciate and respect the fact that you're being vulnerable. So if you blow through your deadline and you don't do it, be like, listen, I'm trying, I didn't do it. Like, you know what I mean? It's like people will resonate because everybody's going through something in life that is that example for them. Everybody has some vulnerable point. And so I'm a big believer in like, Showing people that it's okay to go after what they want and it's okay to fail at it and try again. It's not the end of the world. Um, it's, you know, people are in the same boat as you are and there's no reason to kind of hide that aspect of things. One of the most successful, I think, maybe the most successful Kickstarter, one of them anyways, well, I think it was the coolest cooler. The first okay. time they yeah. launched, they didn't, they didn't meet their goal. And then they launched again and they ended up, you know, raising whatever, millions of dollars. So that's something I think about a lot too. It's like, yeah, nobody, nobody cares about, I mean... Your failures are like, who cares if you can eventually figure one thing out that works? That's all you really need, you know? Yeah, and, and it's funny. If you read about, I mean, almost, I don't know if there is an entrepreneur I've read about that didn't have a huge laundry list of failures. I mean, nobody just, you don't just pop up and be like, hey, I'm the best businessman in the world. You look, read about, uh, I when I say don't read, I love to read about entrepreneurs and their stories because I want to know, you hear about like, hey, I started Apple in my garage and now I'm worth billions of dollars. But like everything in between, you look at the examples uh, of the people who had massive failures throughout life and went on to create some of the best whatever products and services we have. That's that's the norm. The norm is not the 18-year-old kid who's driving a Bentley who made all his money, you know, whatever, selling a course online. So I definitely encourage people to just look at that and realize what it's really like. It's hard. It's gritty. It's dirty. Um, I mean, you look at you know, the Tim Ferris's, the Damon Johns, the, you know, look at the story of KFC. It's very interesting. Walt Disney, Oprah Winfrey, Michael Jordan. I mean, all these people, the best of the best failed miserably. Uh, and so uh, that, that provides me with comfort. <laughs> I know because it's like, okay, what to me is the worst thing in the world right now would be if my company failed. And I, I actually met a guy a couple of weeks ago who had a food company that failed. And I asked him, I said, was that not 
was that not awful? And he was like, well, it wasn't great, but it was 20 years ago. And I didn't ever, well, I wasn't ever worried about living under a bridge and being homeless. So like, you know, whatever, I, I moved to the next thing. And that kind of, to me, was like, there's no reason to worry about the things like that. If they do happen, they're probably not as bad as you think they're going to be. Absolutely. Grant, where can people find out more about you and everything that you're doing? Uh, I have a website. It's grantellis.us. Um, I actually host a podcast as well, and I have a book coming out. Um, you can check stuff out on there. On social media, it's at Grantham Ellis. So that's pretty much it. Or or if you want to buy some peanut butter, you can go to nutbutternation.com. That's where our peanut butter stuff's at. So. What was the name of the podcast again? It's called The Entry Level Entrepreneur. It's, uh, it's a lot of this kind of discussions about kind of the early days of starting a business. I, I will tell you, it's very selfish that I started it. I wanted a, a reason to be able to ask high-level people questions and if i yeah you know if i call up somebody randomly i'm like hey can i buy you coffee and ask you questions they're like i don't have time for that yeah. if i call up and say hey can i interview you they're like yeah sounds good so i, yeah, I say not- the exact same thing <laughs> all the time I it's do, awesome isn't it yeah i mean don't get me wrong i'm very much i uh, want to give back to all the 20 somethings out there and i do eventually want to take all these interviews and write some kind of a book you know yeah. the perfect graduation present i call it like all right here's here's a guide to you know whatever but anyways uh, oh it's awesome I, I mean i love it that's when you reached out i was like yeah absolutely because that's you find that we kind of have the same mission right you just want people to know more than we knew or whatever the case may be and can we help you out you know even before the conversation started you asked me about you know, whether I didn't want to talk about things because of competition, I'm like the right, you'll know the right people you need to be meeting with when they say like, no man, like it's cool. Like let's talk about everything, right? right. That the real, the highest level business people I've ever dealt with are like that. Mm-hmm. The ones who hold things close to their vest and are standoffish typically get caught in the middle. So if you want to get to high level, like, man, just throw it all out there. Let's help each other. Let's all do, you know, I want you to be successful. I want you to crush it. And then I'll push you and tell everybody about you and, vice versa so yeah there's enough business for everybody you just need to help everybody out and get all the info out you can absolutely grant thank you so much for coming on the show i really appreciate it no i appreciate it i really enjoyed it